I expect I'm not alone in saying that I've enjoyed playing video games for what constitutes a large part of my life. Shocking, isn't it? I'm sure if you're in that position too, there are those moments which without a doubt have been all but imprinted on your mind. The first one of those for me might sound rather innocuous, but it comes in the form of a simple message. Got you, sheepoid. The deaf message from Llamasoft's Sheep in Space. Since then, the Llamasoft library is something I've enjoyed, with a going back to many of the earlier games or their more modern works. So when Digital Eclipse announced their second entry in the Gold Master series of interactive documentaries was going to focus on Jeff Minter and the early days of Llamasoft, I was pretty much sold. But now it's finally here, and so it happens to be time to dive into Llamasoft the Jeff Minter story to see just how well it conveys the story of those early days, and if it could inspire folks to enter the bleepy, zappy, frantic, and fluffy world of the early days of Jeff Minter and Llamasoft. As one should expect from Digital Eclipse's documentary projects, Llamasoft, the Jeff Minter story, is structured around four chapters. These cover the foundational years to Llamasoft's 8-bit highs, Jeff's exploration into light synths, before closing out with the lean years of the late 1980s moving into the early 1990s, closing with the development of what many call his magnum opus, Tempest 2000. The result here is a focus on breadth over depth, so most of the material presented comes in the form of photos from various events, along with commentary from Jeff and other people. You'll also get scans of advertisements, magazines, and of course his newsletter, Nature of the Beast. Combined with video snippets which are contributed from the upcoming Heart of Neon documentary, it goes a long, long way to letting you get that appreciation of how computer gaming evolved in 1980s Britain. Something many classic projects don't go out of their way to cover. It also goes a long way to showing the community side of the experience too. Something which honestly struck a bit of a chord with me, based on many of my own experiences in making games and running this channel over the last few years. Look, the experience of working your way through the history is going to take quite a bit of time to sift through, especially if you read all of those documents in ever so much detail. But with the tidbits like notes and documentation and development notes for games that never made it out, there's a lot in there to learn, read and process. For me, even knowing part of this story, seeing the whole thing laid out the way it was, really shows just how impressive Jeff's journey was in those early days of the company. Let's face it though, despite the documentary focus of this project, it does have an aspect of being able to play through the history and not just read about it. Like the other Digital Eclipse documentary projects, you can access the games from a dedicated games list, but you can also access them through the timeline. Again, this really just helps contextualise where those individual games fit in the wider history. Of the 43 titles that are included, there are a few doubles. Typically games which were ported to multiple systems, a fairly common thing in the early days. It's always interesting to experience these, especially as many of them were done by Jeff himself, which, even for back in those days, was surprisingly uncommon. You usually saw games ported by different people to multiple machines. The results of this, whether it's something simpler and more direct like Grid Runner, or whether it was something more involved like Laser Zone, it really shows the evolution of the process and reflects Jeff's thoughts on the process. As noted from the documentation included with the Yaks progress compilation, included here and something I've already looked at in the past elsewhere. I think for many dedicated fans though, the biggest draw in the game's catalogue is going to have a chance to try out the prototype of Attack of the Mutant Camels 89, a game intended for release on the ill-fated Conix multi-system. Some of that system's history and fate is explored within documentary sections, but being able to try out an actual playable build of this game, it's certainly something special to put your eyes on. Now, 
doesn't happen to be one of those games you're probably going to play a lot. Honestly, probably not. It's a shame this one never made it though, as even from the prototype that's here, you could certainly see a lot of potential, both from the Connex multi-system hardware and with what Jeff was able to do with. But I'm glad we really got the chance to sit down and have a play with this. It's a cool little demo, and it's a shame that it never was finished and the multi-system was abandoned due to all the issues that happened. Again, the documentary sections do a good job of showing that side of it too. For everything else, the bulk of the library, unsurprisingly, is centered around the Commodore 64, which is really where most of Jeff's output during this time was focused. Along that, of course, there are games for the ZX81, ZX Spectrum, Commodore VIC-20, Atari 8-bits, Atari ST, and of course, unsurprisingly, the Atari Jaguar. The game selection covers plenty of Jeff's biggest hits, and though I wish there were a few titles that were included, I can't really complain all that much with what we get to play with here. The most important question though is how good is the emulation? And for the most part, I think it's solid enough. I feel like I did encounter some minor input lag. For the reference here, this is the PlayStation 5 version of the collection and I was playing with a standard dual sets control controller wirelessly and there were some games, particularly with the Commodore 64 versions, where I kind of struggled at compared to playing them on my original C64 setup. Now, I'm not sure if that's just because I think the emulation is running NTSC mode rather than PAL. You know, being Australian, I've grown up with PAL machines unsurprisingly, but it definitely just didn't quite feel right. But again, I'm chalking it down to a bit of input lag and the game's running a little faster for the sake of this. That does also explain some minor visual glitches I saw in a few games though. And I guess, look, for me, I guess because this was a C64 and that's the machine I've spent a lot of time with, I probably noticed these minor things more than I did anything else. I don't think I really noticed anything with the Vic or the Atari 8 bits or the Spectrum, it's just the C64 ones stuck out a little more. As with both Atari 50 and the making of Karateka, you do get a rewind mode in that you can have a chance of avoiding a costly mistake by rewinding a few seconds and trying to avoid that dastardly moment. You know, it's that thing where you go for that high score run, of course. You've also got the options for filters and borders, giving you that TV style simulation. That helps add to the vibes, which I really appreciate that it's sort of like the monitor and the other stuff there. What I really, and I, and I mean really appreciate though, is the scan documentation. It's a detail few other collections include, and having it too handy and accessible is very, very nice. Also, with some of the games here, you're absolutely going to want to read it before playing. And even whilst you are playing, it's great that it's accessible from within the pause menu. Because not only do you get to experience Jeff's atmosphere building, but because honestly, there's a few of these games that you're going to need to know the tricks for in order to beat them. What's also not surprising to see, but greatly appreciated, is that there has been thought put into how these games are controlled. Plenty of his early ones required keyboard entry to set options before starting, and most of these are reworked to be adjustable from the controller without needing to mess about the virtual keyboard. I also appreciated seeing Llamatron on the Atari ST controllable with a dual stick setup, just as you'd expect. Now, I'll admit I've never really played this much on the original machine. I don't know how easy that is to configure, but I really appreciated it here. It's details like this, I feel, that make collections like this handy over running generic emulators sometimes. It's the chance to put a little thought into how these controls work that makes experiencing them a little more convenient. But there is one case where this doesn't quite work out. And it's a game that's sort of important to me, and that's Battle X. Unlike Jeff's other games, Battle X is about mastering five distinct subgames to ultimately win. Now, these aren't played in sequence yet, like an ocean film tie-in or something, but you're free to jump between them at any point. Coupled with how the game manages difficulty, it, sets, it lets you set your challenge based on what games you find easier or tougher to play. So I was surprised that you can only pick a subgame when you start it up. There's no way to change subgames mid-game, meaning that if you want to go from one to the other, you've got to abort your current game. 
I am being a little nitpicky here, but I feel not being able to enjoy this game as it was originally designed takes away some of its distinctiveness, and it makes it a little less special as a result. Again, I think I'm reading a little too much into this. It is primarily a documentary, and I could imagine if you were in a museum, maybe something like this would be set up. You wouldn't be able to play each sub-game in that wider context, and honestly, maybe being able to play them all at the easiest difficulty makes things a little better for everyone who's just casually passing through. The final inclusion here is a remastered edition of Gridrun. Now this takes the Commodore 64 adaptation and adds the kind of visual and oral polish you get from a modern indie game release. It also includes the ability to dynamically switch between the original C64 visuals and those enhanced ones. It's a neat party trick and it's quite impressive to see the new visuals running on top of the C64 code. And a great showing for emulation as a way to enhance the experience once more. Now I'll admit I kinda wish it was done with the VIC-20 original or with Matrix but it's a pretty cool little addition and a great fun trick to enjoy. But the best use of emulation for enhancement really comes with Jeff's light synths. Psychedelia for the Commodore 64 and Color Space for the Atari 8-bits, the first two that Jeff put out. Now, I guess it's worth clarifying, if you're unfamiliar with the term light synthesizer, consider it a program which generates interactive visuals. Typically, you'll do it in conjunction with playing some music. Now, the modern equivalents of these programs tend to be included with music players. And of course, if you're an Xbox 360 owner, the visualizer there was actually developed by Llamasoft. So, a little modern history there. Both Psychedelia and Color Space are quite comprehensive for the time, so you're really going to need those manuals to get to grips with before you start messing around with them. Unless you just want to use them and watch the pretty demo modes that they both start with. If you find these new to you, like they are for me, the work Digital Eclipse has done in putting a structured interface on top of them goes a long way to making them approachable and being able to adjust settings with now, having a bit of an idea of what you're actually going to do. It's a pretty simple interface. I really like how it works. It gave me a chance to sit down and enjoy these and it felt so much better to use because I could just visualize what I was trying to do when I was setting up options and messing around with the results. The thing is though, the enhancements and embellishments don't stop there. Oh no, not at all. First and foremost, these are programs that are meant to be enjoyed with the music cranked up. And while you could just simply play your own, I genuinely appreciate that they've taken the effort to include some tracks taken from recent Llamasoft games to automatically put them on in the background. Now, it's not the kind of music that originally inspired Jeff when creating these back in the day, but it's great to have something included to help spur the imagination once you get your head around how it all works. Though at the same time, it does make me a little sad that we've lost custom soundtrack integrations on modern consoles. It would have been fantastic to have this experience of messing about whilst you're playing music from your music library or whatever. And yeah, of the PC Verships collection, you could run your preferred music library player of choice in the background and mess around with it. But still, I'm just, you know, a little inspired here. It's quite an experience to crank up some music and loud firing up one of these programs and just enjoying the experience and messing about and creating your own pretty light patterns into it as a result. Now, I know for myself that these light sims are a bit of an aspect of Jeff's career that I really haven't come across much. I've known they've existed, but I've never really had an impetus to play around with them before here. And unsurprisingly, I really enjoyed sitting down, messing about with psychedelia and color space and just enjoying that aspect of it. It helped give me that space to have some appreciation of them. Well, the recommended way to enjoy the games here is by checking them out as you encounter them in exploring those chapters of the main documentary portion. Though I'm sure for some folks, there's sometimes you're just gonna have that desire to get in and get zapping. If that's you, this next chapter is just going to be me talking about a number of games that I found most enjoyable to play.
play. Now, some of these I've touched on in previous videos, but for most of them, it's been quite a while since that's the case, so, so consider it a good little refresher of things I've looked at in the past. First up, we've got Abductor for the VIC-20. Before diving into Llamas Off the Jeff Minter story, I had never really gone back to the earliest, earliest days of the Llamas Off library. I'm glad I did here though, because I wouldn't have gotten to enjoy this one. It's delightfully simple. You move your craft from left to right and zap the aliens before they abduct the humans. The formations get quite a bit more devious as things go on, but you'll get extra firepower to help, so it all balances out. You can see the spark of Jeff's creativity here. Yeah, it's a pretty simple run-of-the-mill shooter, but considering this is squeezed into an unexpanded VIC-20, so you know, 3k of RAM, I found it quite an absolute thrill to play, despite some little weird niggles here and there. Definitely one to check out if you want to see the sort of creativity in the earliest days when he started sort of pushing beyond just cloning arcade games. Now we're keeping to the VIC-20 thrills here with Matrix. Now Grid Runner is certainly one of the more iconic early Llamasoft games, but for me Matrix adds just enough to the formula that it becomes even more frantic, even more chaotic, and even more fun. It's, you might think it's just Grid Runner turned up to 11, but honestly, even that wouldn't be a bad thing, but Matrix is oh so much more. It starts with facing larger droid groups in each level, now offering more devious patterns once they reach the bottom of the grid. Then you've got the Snitch, a humanoid trader that could trigger the XY Zappers outside of their cycle should you be in the wrong place. Then of course you've got the devious deflection devices, which can cause an unwary shot to take you out should you be zapping blindly. Matrix for me truly exhibits Jeff's design ideas here, offering a challenging progression to a simple game thanks to the extra memory it has to hand. Though my personal recommendation is probably for the original VIC-20 version, the Commodore 64 version is no slouch. But that might be my appreciation for tiny sprites talking. Even though Jeff himself is not a fan of that smaller visuals of the C64's high res, it's still just as tight to play as the Vic original. Debuting on the Commodore 64 in 1983, Hover Bobba is one of the biggest departures from the Llamasoft style we're probably going to see here. Mainly because it's not a zappy zappy blast fest, but instead a mole where you'll be guiding hapless Gordon Bennett around to mow a succession of increasingly more intricate lawns. The problem though is you've um, borrowed your neighbour's lawnmower, and unsurprisingly they're not at all thrilled. So you'll have to avoid them while trying not to mow those pretty flowers and avoiding the wrath of man's best friend. It might not be violent, but Hover Bobber manages to keep up with the arcade chaos Jeff delivers oh so well, and it really makes something that stands out amongst his library, yet delivers all the details Llamasoft would be known for. <laughs> 1984's weird and wonderful Ancipital is pick number four. I'll admit, I've not played this a massive amount over the years, but like Hover Bobber, it's one of those games in which Jeff was inspired by something that wasn't from the arcades, specifically those flick screen games like Attic Attack on the Spectrum, and managed to give them the Llama Soft touch. Jeff describes Ancipital as a progressive blaster. The goal is that you have to work your way through a 100 room maze, disarming each and every one of those rooms. You might think that it's going to be more chill than his other games as a result, and all I can say to that is, not on your mind. The introduction of gravitational movement and being able to walk on the walls in each room means there's a challenge in locomotion you need to adapt to before you can get on with the blasting of hostiles and the mapping of the space. Now just let that sink in for a moment. Mapping in a Llamasoft game. And that's why Ancipital is rather special and well worth taking the time to explore and map out. I know that I really, really want to sit down and spend a lot more time with this one after being reminded of its uniqueness here. Now, this 
despite everything I raised earlier with the emulation and the inability to pick sub-games while a game is in progress, Battlex from 1985 so happens to be number 5 in my picks. Why is that? Even with the issues I raised, it's still a game worth exploring, as the core concept around its sub-games is something I feel is incredibly distinctive, even with the sub-games themselves. All these years later, I can't think of any game, any modern game, or any for that matter, which has managed to interlink them to the difficulty and time the way Jeff managed to do so in 1985. Conceptually, each of the sub-games you'll encounter is a different phase of a wider campaign, and ultimately success requires you to master all of them to earn their respective completion tokens. The wider challenge, of course, comes from time. When starting a game, the difficulty level you pick controls the time that you'll have to complete the game. As the timer ticks down, the challenge increases, meaning you'll need to choose which sub-games you want to focus on based on how much time has elapsed in the game and which of those you're better or worse at. So you might want to clear out the ones you're not so good at first, because the other ones you could do later when they're a little harder. Or maybe you just want to get those ones you're good at first out of the way and focus more time on the ones you're not so good at. Though this aspect isn't really presented well in the collection, the challenge of learning the subgames, combined with the joy of mastering them, it's still here, and it's still well worth your time to learn those intricacies of each of them and try to master them, even if you can only do them one at a time. So we move from one of the more blindingly creative efforts or outwardly blindingly creative in Battlex, and we go on to Iridus Alpha from 1986. It appears to be more conventional at first glance, but there is a reason this game got five llamas in complexity here. And no, it's not because of those damned liquor ships. Essentially, Iridus Alpha has you clearing the surface of many realities. I know it sounds weird, but trust me. If it was just that, it certainly wouldn't be worth including. It would feel a little run of the mill. But particularly, it's about mastering the dual planes of reality, which kicks in once you've made it a few waves in. Survival comes from a few factors. Firstly, energy management. Blasting enemies will add energy to Gilby, your controllable vehicle here, while being hit, colliding with them will drain it. When you run out, you die. You can also land on the main landscape to the core to offload energy or reclaim it if needed. Once you get a bit of the way into the game, you also need to start switching between upper and lower realities, as entropy happens to sap the energy of the other Gilby the longer you're away from that reality. So you frequently need to switch between these planes in order to keep the, the Gilbys alive. Now, Getting there requires you to survive the onslaught of the aforementioned Lecker ships. And that is better said than done, I won't lie. I could sort of get through there consistently when I was playing on real hardware, but it took me a long, long time and I was grabbing footage of it here to do it here. This makes it probably the toughest game in the collection as a result. And Jeff does touch upon, you know, reflecting that, yeah, the design sensibilities weren't as strong in that era. The thing is though, if you can survive it, if you can get through the liquor ships and unlock the the rest of the game, I think you will find a rewarding, challenging evolution on the shmup that really can offer something more than you might expect. The first and only of the 16-bit games I want to recommend here is none other than Llamatron 2112 released as shareware back in 1991. The importance of Llamatron and how it helped Llamasoft in the early 90s is touched on in the main documentary, but that's not really why I want to recommend this. No, I want to recommend it because it's one damn fine blast. Llamatron might be inspired by Williams' classic Robotron 2084, though unlike most unofficial clones of an arcade hit, the focus here is on making it more suitable for play at home rather than just bringing over the arcade experience wholesale. This starts, of course, with tweaking the difficulty and is joined by the inclusion of a helper drone, which gives you a little extra firepower. Then there's the pickups, which add even more and truly make cleaning each level a joy on oh so many ways. Lavatron really exemplifies the Llamasoft spirit. 
And in itself, that makes it one you truly need to spend some time with if you've not done so already. It really kind of shows the progression of Jeff's design patterns, especially coming ahead of, you know, coming before, coming after a game like Hero Salva, which, you know, was very much a, a unique progressive experience, but one that was ridiculously hard. Here, you get a challenge from Mario, but it's much fairer because he's sort of grown as a creator. Definitely makes it well worth your time playing. And now for my final one. It's really only apt to talk about what is, for many, Jeff's magnum opus. Tempest 2000, released in 1994. Now, I'm only going to be brief touching on it here because uh, it hasn't been that long since I actually did a video on it. But, suffice to say, Tempest 2000 takes the concepts of Dave Toyer's original arcade game and turns it not up to 11, but rather, 12. It all comes from that amazing rave-inspired soundtrack. The new beings you're going to have to learn to outwit through 100 levels of chaos, the chill out bonus stages, and all the fancy power ups that you get, and of course, the ever so awesome AI droid. The way that the challenge ramps up slowly, but most importantly, fairly. It really shows the growth in Jeff's design philosophies, especially compared to the 8 bit days and things like those. Yes, I'm gonna mention them again, the liquor ships that you see in Eris Alpha. Tempest 2000 is really an impressive game, and it's one that really serves the highlight of a collection here. And it's the perfect way to cap off the selections included with Llamasoft, the Jeff Minter story. From all of that, let's start tying things up and drawing things to a close because there's a number of ways that you can look at Marmosoft the Jeff Minter story. You could treat it simply as a collection of games. And sure, there are 40 odd games and life sims here, and that's pretty exciting. I don't think we've seen this many games in a collection, and I don't think we've seen many of Jeff's titles ever get reissued in this way. And so if you're curious about how things were in the UK during the days of the 8-bits, I think it's a really good showing of what that kind of environment was like. But, as with Digital Eclipse's previous works, Atari 50 and the making of Karateka, the real value here in getting access to, oh, so much historical material. Those scans, those photos, the design notes, and the videos and interviews paint a wonderful tapestry of this scene as well. And that's something that I feel tends to be undershadowed quite a bit in the classic gaming scene. You know, a lot of these projects tend to be focused on Americans and American developed games or Japanese developed games. You don't really get a lot of the UK side of things here. And so I'm glad that there is one like this that is focusing on that side of it. It's where it truly comes into its own. Yes, you might not get to minute levels of detail about individual games, but it serves more to talk about Jeff himself and his journey as a creator and the evolution of his games and his creative outlets over this first part of Llamasoft's life. Again, I think the only real sore spot is the handling of the subgames and the battle books. Now, I do believe that this is something that I hope gets patched up. It would be lovely to enjoy the challenge of completing all of those subgames as the game was originally designed to, rather than playing them out, in con out of context one at a time. And context here is ever so important. I, as I've said more than a few times on the channel here, I feel the context that we have to enjoy these games lets us really explore them and, more importantly, talk about them to each other in ways that are more about our personal nostalgia for them. Now, personal nostalgia is important, but it's personal for a reason. Our experiences in history, they're always going to take the experience. They're always going to shift things from how we see them compared to how someone else sees them. And I think that that can make it kind of exclusionary because if you can't get an even footing. And one of the things which really, really excites me about this collection is that there's going to be people who may only know of Jeff's work from his more recent games. And they're going to be introduced to the glory of his 8-bit output. Also, I'm not going to lie here, I cannot wait to see how they're going to respond to the damn liquor ships of Era to Selfa. I, I, I can't wait to see that I'm so much, I'm sorry. It really excites me.
But with that, it should be no surprise for me to say that Llamasoft, the Jeff Minter story, carries an ever so strong recommendation. It celebrates the work of an important independent creator, one who happens to represent an era of gaming that doesn't really get a lot of traction in the modern classic gaming scene outside of those who were basically there or have that in their backgrounds. Whether you're a fan of Jeff's works from those days and want a chance to enjoy them again and learn about them in a bit more detail, or someone interested in gaming history and wants to see how the medium has progressed and changed from the days when solo coders could create something from their bedrooms and leave a big impact on the gamers. I cannot wait to see what comes next for Digital Eclipse with the Gold Master series, because whether it covers something I'm familiar with, or something I'm not, I'm sure there's going to be something I'll get out of it. Whether it's shedding new light on a classic, or giving me a chance to reevaluate something I'm not as familiar with as I should be, I'll always relish the opportunity to do so. And with that, let's close things up here. I hope you've enjoyed the video, and as always, if you did, consider doing the usual things. Hit the thumbs up, let's talk about stuff in the comments, maybe, maybe tell me what games in the collection you're most excited to check out or revisit. So tell your friends to word of mouth is incredibly powerful in this day and age. As always, there's of course the other things too, subscribing to the channel to be informed when new videos are released, or join the mailing list, which is in the video description, to be notified them without the curation nonsense that algorithms force upon you, so you get an email when an episode drops. And the final one of course is, if you really want to help things out, one of the biggest things you can do is consider joining the series Patreon, again in the description, yeah, contribute and help me keep this stuff going. But I'm not going to say anything more here than just to thank you all very much for watching.